Right, so um, let me write uh, the title, Probabilistic Existence of Regular Combinatorial Structures. And this work is a joint work with uh, Greg Cooperberg and uh, Shachar Lovett. Uh, let me just write. Um, joint with uh, Greg Cooperberg and Shachar Lovett. So earlier this week, uh, especially in the lecture talk, uh, in the lectures of uh, Peter Kivash, we've heard about uh, designs. And uh, here I will explain how one may construct, for instance, designs and also other regular structures, uh, not quite construct, but prove existence and count how many there are via probabilistic methods, uh, rather different from those of Peter, and also not working in the same regime of the parameters, as you will see, for a different regime. Okay, let me start with a, a general question. Suppose you have a matrix which has integer entries. Um, and later in the talk, I will index the rows of this matrix by B and the columns by A, like this. It has integer entries. For now, I don't assume anything. And then let me ask, is there a small, a small subset of the rows of uh, T? contained in B, such that, and I'd like the average on the small subset, so let's say I pick these rows, and then I take the average over the rows which I picked, maybe I will denote this matrix by phi, and I'd like it to be the same as the average over all the rows. So I'd like that the average of the sum of the rows which are in T of phi of those rows. By phi of a row, I mean the, the row itself, the vector. So this is a sum of vectors. To be uh, one over the size of b, the, aver the sum over all the rows. This is the question which I will ask. And the emphasis here is on small. Of course, I can do this if I take t to be all of b. Uh, maybe I can do it also with, I don't know, half of B, but usually this is not what I will be interested in. Usually I will be interested in a small subset in some sense. And you will see that this general um, question encompasses many questions, and the answer can be quite interesting. Um, let me just begin already by saying that there is a counterexample. So you cannot always do this. One, one may hope that maybe this is always possible, but this is not the case. Uh, a counterexample of Alon and Vu from 97, uh, what they do, maybe I don't write in full, but I'll say they find a regular hypergraph having no sub-hypergraph, which is still regular. So in their example, you see here the vertices and here the edges. So their matrix is a 0-1 matrix where you have the same number of ones in each, um, in each row. And the average of all their rows is something, but there is no subset having the same averages, and they have a very big matrix. So, so somehow you, this is not always possible. Let me not dwell on the example. Um, but what we will see later in the talk is that there are cases when it is possible, and one can give general conditions under which it will be possible. And these conditions are satisfied in cases of interest. Okay, so let me proceed by um, giving the first example just to understand better what we are looking at. Um, so we can discuss, for instance, the example of designs. Uh, we've already seen designs in this, uh, this week, so let me perhaps be brief about the definition. I hope uh, people here know. Um, so a, just the notation is a bit different from what uh, Kivash uses, so maybe I will introduce that more in full. So a TVK lambda design is a set, uh, a set of um, K element subsets of uh, one up to V such that every T element subset, T element subset is contained in lambda, is contained in exactly 
um, in exactly lambda um, of the sets. So the, the word sets is perhaps uh, overused here, but I hope uh, people know already this definition. For instance, the, the Fano plane, so you see that um, every uh, pair is contained in a single triple. Okay, and uh, I claim that designs can be put in this framework. How can they be put? Well, this is, uh, we've seen already this matrix. This is the incidence matrix. I put here all the T subsets, and I put here all the K subsets, and the matrix is the matrix of containment. The indicator, if I call this subset B and this subset A, the indicator that A is contained in B. So I get a 0, 1 matrix like that, and I claim that a design is exactly a choice of rows, meaning that you choose K subsets, such that if you sum over all the rows which you pick, each T subset gets the same number, and one observes that this same number is also what you would get if you would sum over all the rows and, and average. So this averaging is just so that I don't have to say lambda in a sense. So really, finding a design is a special case of uh, this question which I put on the, the board here. And one is interested in a small design, meaning in, this would mean that lambda is small. Okay, um, and I guess designs are well motivated. I will not um, motivate them more, but um, there are certainly necessary conditions for this. Necessary conditions for existence. And let me perhaps copy them from my note. Um, we need that K choose S divided by V choose S times V choose T divided by K choose T times lambda is an integer when S is between 0 and T. Under these conditions, it is uh, plausible that there exists a design, but uh, one of the main questions is, do these conditions suffice? And as we've heard from Peter, these conditions do suffice if V is sufficiently large and K, lambda, and T are fixed. And what I will tell you later on is that this is also true in other regimes of the parameters. Okay, and uh, this is our theorem, which is based on uh, that general framework, a theorem from um, 2013, that there exists some constant such that if the necessary conditions are satisfied, if necessary conditions are satisfied, and if uh, lambda is a bit big. Lambda is bigger than CV over T to the CT. Um, this is the main condition. There is also a condition from the other side. I will mention it in a second, but this one is somehow uh, just because of a certain symmetry. You can take the complementary design. So just in a sense to prevent that. Um, so what is this condition? Let us focus on the left-hand side. It says that I cannot give you a very, very small design. A Steiner system, for instance, the best design would have lambda equals 1. Still, this condition um, leaves you with a, a very big non-trivial regime. Uh, the, trivial, um, the trivial design is by taking all of the k subsets, in which case you will have v choose k um, elements in your design. And here we have, well, lambda is roughly V choose T, which is much smaller if K is at least, let's say, 20 times T or so. Uh, so this is still a non-trivial regime. And the conclusion is then a design, a T V K lambda design exists. So we verify that the necessary conditions are also sufficient if lambda is a bit big, polynomially big. 
Uh, and we, right, and I should say that uh, this is a, not an asymptotic theorem. This is uh, for any, there, there exists a universal constant C, and now choose your favorite parameters V, T, K, and lambda, which satisfy these conditions. So K could be half of N, or could be anything else. But, and then um, this theorem applies. Maybe if K is half of N, then this other condition, uh, I'm not sure now if you can catch half of N, but certainly you can catch one over a hundred of N, depending on this constant. Okay, so we certainly the parameters here could depend on each other. Uh, okay, sorry, I'll try and write a little bigger. Sorry about that. Um, and uh, I said that this is the main condition. This condition is here only because if you have a design, then also its complement by taking all the rows which you did not take will be a design. And somehow both of these need to be big. We cannot have um, any of them small. And we have a moreover part. Our theorems allow us not only to show the existence of designs, they also allow us to count. And the moreover part is that the number of T VK lambda designs uh, with the above parameters equal, and let me write, let me denote by N uh, the quantity V choose T divided by K choose T lambda. This is exactly the size of your design size of design, that is, any design with these parameters must have exactly this many um, k subsets in it. And uh, let me also denote by p, n over v choose k, this is the proportion of rows. If I have chosen exactly capital N rows, then their proportion out of all possible rows is exactly p. And then in terms of these parameters, the number of designs is, and I'll write a long formula. The, it is not, what, it's not interesting perhaps to see the exact formula. What is interesting is to understand the accuracy of it. So I'll write it, but maybe, maybe it will be a bit mysterious. 1 over 2 pi p 1 minus p raised to the power 1 half v choose t um, times p to the n times 1 minus p to the v choose k minus n times a product uh, s going from 0 to t uh, of a ratio k minus s choose uh, k minus t divided by v minus t minus s divided by k minus t. Um, and I I'm sorry, this should have written it like that. And this raised to a power 1 half V choose S minus uh, V choose S minus 1. So I told you it's a long formula and really the formula itself is not so important. Um, and what's important is that this is up to 1 plus little o of 1. So this means that I can tell you the number of designs to a 10% accuracy. Ask for any percent accuracy that you want, 1% accuracy, I can tell you how many designs are there with the given parameters to that accuracy. Um, and this little of 1 is explicit. If you want fixed parameters, that's all right. Uh, this is roughly uh, 1 over square root n. Let me not get into an exact formula. It's explicit that there is this constant. We did not calculate it, but you can in principle calculate it. It's not even too big, maybe 100 would suffice, or even 20 sometimes. Um, big N is defined here. It is the number of um, elements in your design, number of K subsets. Um, so this is a, a rather good accuracy. And when our, when our techniques apply, they give existence and counting results with this accuracy. But they don't always apply, you see there are conditions. Um, let me also mention that the same technique that I will explain that, uh, that is a general question applies also to other instances. Um, maybe I can write them on the back here. So maybe not all of you know what are these instances. This will not be important in the rest of the talk. But we can also do the same for orthogonal arrays. 
and obtain uh, new results when the alphabet size is not uh, 2. When it's 2, these results were known by work of McKay and co-authors. New results when Q is different from 2. Um, and again, our results never work for the smallest possible structures, just like they, they do not give Steiner systems. They, they always need you to have a slightly some polynomial overhead above the smallest possible structure. However, if you allow this polynomial over it, then you get the same type of result. You get existence, and you get the number up to, say, 1% accuracy. Um, and they also apply uh, to another model of TY's uniform permutations. Um, this is a rather new uh, model. I don't know how long it's been around. I've heard it uh, for the first time from uh, Moni Naor in 2004. They had a question about that. Maybe I'll just briefly say what is this model because I'd like to say what our results give. Um, in this model, you ask for, ask for a subset T inside the permutation group Sn, which uh, if you test it for somehow quasi-randomness, you, you'd like to say that uh, a uniform element, if pi is uniformly chosen from T, so if you take a permutation from T randomly, you'd like to say that you cannot distinguish it from a fully random permutation by any test which only considers T coordinates. So um, this pi is approximates the uniform distribution. This T approximates all of Sn. Somewhat similar to how designs uh, approximate taking all subsets, V choose K. Um, and so if pi is chosen from T, then for any uh, i1 up to it uh, distinct and j1 up to jt distinct, the probability that pi sends i1 to j1 and up to pi sends it to jt is exactly what it was for the fully uniform permutation, that is, 1 over n, n minus 1, times all the way to n minus t plus 1. So uh, if you have a subset like this, then this subset is called a t-wise uniform permutation. Uh, and that's another regular structure, um, but a subset of permutations now. And the point was that this is a bit similar to those of you who know uh, to orthogonal arrays, However, how do you construct, say, orthogonal arrays? Usually there's some linear construction. You take a linear subset or something, a subspace or something like that. You'd like somehow to do the same here. So you'd like to say that T maybe is a subgroup. How about finding a subgroup of Sn which satisfies this? And that would be very nice. Um, sometimes such subgroups exist and then they're called transitive subgroups. But um, an unfortunate fact is that Transitive subgroups do not exist uh, when t is bigger than 3. So there was an open question um, uh, to get a small t for a t bigger than 3. And this question um, is to some extent resolved by our results. We can get uh, a t. Notice that by this relationship you cannot expect t to be any smaller than n times n minus 1 times n minus t plus 1 because um, this probability is 1 over the size of t times something. So t has to be at least this magnitude and we can get um, the t to be as big as n to the ct which is like this magnitude but maybe raised to a power 20 so again there is this um, polynomial overhead. And the, the best existing result before was, um, was uh, that the size of t can be as small as t to the 2n. So for instance, if you'd like uh, a four-wise uniform permutation, here you have n to the, I don't know, 100, and here you have 4 to the n, or 16 to the n. Okay, uh, so this is just to say that there are applications to our method. Was there a question? And this is an existence result, whereas this was an explicit construction, actually, of myself and Hilary Finucane and Yuri Viari. Um, 
Uh, right, so in this question, there is one obvious lower bound that the size is at least n, n minus 1, up to n minus t plus 1, just because this probability is 1 over the size of t times the number of um, permutations that which satisfy this, so size of t has to be at least that. So we get this to write asymptotic except for the constant in the exponent, and this is also true in the case of designs, which I mentioned earlier. Um, but again, there is this lambda has to be polynomially big somehow. Um, that's right. So this is just to say that this method has several applications. Uh, recently, I've also uh, looked at an application to zeros of random polynomials with plus minus one coefficients. So that's an application of a different flavor, maybe. Okay. And in the rest of the talk, I'd like to go back to this abstract framework, for which you see that there is also a counterexample. Ah, yeah, sure. What happens if you obey <coughs> not integers but uh, non-negative entries? This, uh, this but real numbers or? Yeah, no, integers. Uh huh. But non-negative. Yes, usually they will be non-negative. Yes. No, I mean a general framework. If you can you get, give some uh, not a zero one yeah. matrix, but a matrix of non-negative integers. I didn't say it was a zero one matrix. No, no. I say ask instead of integer entries, just take non. For instance, if you want to sample the election with many parties and you want a small sample from this uh, So I, I'm not sure I fully understood the question. Non-negative entries, if they are integer, they're contained here. If they're rational, then you could do exactly the same. Better if you have non-negative. Ah, can we do better? No. Usually it's non-negative. In all our applications, it's non-negative. This is all we can do. Uh, if it's rational numbers, it's the same, uh, exact same thing. And if it's real numbers, then you, you get into questions of whether they're linearly independent over Q, and you, you can somehow deduce something, but it's not what we want. Okay, um, other questions? <coughs> Yes, it's not impossible. This is what you get for t equals 1, 2, and 3, because for that case, there are in fact transitive subgroups of Sn, and they're so good that you can achieve. For, for instance, for t equals 1, you can just take the powers of, uh, of one cycle. You take a cycle which, um, which ta takes 1 to 2, 2 to 3, and so on, and all its powers, you have n powers, they exactly give you such a thing. It's not known anything beyond this, I think. I, I don't know any other result. It's, there is no better lower bound. Maybe, you know, you can improve it by one somehow. Maybe you can find an argument. But there is no much better lower bound. Uh, and it's not impossible that you can achieve it. Uh, just like in uh, designs, uh, if you ask yourself for a Steiner system of a very small v, then uh, Peter's result do not tell you that it exists, and maybe it does, and maybe it doesn't. Um, any other questions? Uh, okay. So uh, for the rest of the talk, I'd like to go back to the general framework, and I'd like to discuss sufficient conditions, and really this is our theorem. There, this, it's not always possible to find a small subset, but under certain conditions it is possible, and I'd like to explain that. And I'd also like to tell you what is the approach, how does one actually prove it, and this will involve this probability, which I mentioned in the beginning. Okay. So first, perhaps, um, Perhaps I will tell you a bit about the general approach. Maybe this, uh, this would be the most interesting thing. Um, so here is the, so back to general framework. Uh, sorry, back to general framework. And uh, maybe I will tell you the approach, the idea. The idea is to choose this subset randomly. So choose t randomly by putting each row in t, each row in t with probability p independently. 
So maybe I've not said so much still. I take each row of the matrix with probability P and I place it inside my T independently. And then I will ask if uh, I get a T which is good. Of course, the probability of getting a T which is good is going to be very small, exponentially small. However, I'd like to view this process somehow dynamically. So let me define X to be a sum over all the rows which I've taken uh, of uh, phi of the rows. So I define X to be the sum of all the rows which I've taken. Um, and what I want is um, to get a subset of size n, I want that um, x <coughs> equals n over the size of b times the sum um, b and t uh, of phi of b, uh, sorry, b and b, and that the size of uh, t is n. So in terms of this random vector x, what I want is that x happens to, lend, to end up at this value and that it has exactly n elements. Now I'd like to view this dynamically. You see, x is a sum of vectors. I'm thinking of integer vectors. So you can think that we're working in some high dimensional lattice. How uh, high dimensional? You, you should think of z to the a. So here I have um, a, the, the index set of the columns is a. So I'm working in z to the a, and then I start at zero, and I look at the first row. And I need to decide, do I take the first row or don't I take the first row? So this corresponds to two possible steps. Either I stay where I am with probability one minus p, or I take the first row and then I move somewhere, and this happens with probability p. And then I continue, either I stay where I am, or I move to a different point with probability p. So really this x, I can think of it dynamically as being a random walk on a high dimensional lattice with steps which are independent, but not of the same um, structure. Each step is different. Each step is a different vector. And now uh, the idea is that maybe, so we've all uh, learned in school that if you have a random walk and you take many steps, then your ending position is Gaussian. So maybe X satisfies a central limit theorem. Maybe there is a local central limit theorem, central limit theorem, so that uh, X is approximately Gaussian. This is the idea of this talk. In fact, we will prove that under certain conditions on your matrix, X is approximately Gaussian. And if you knew that, then you could calculate the probability that it ends up here. Really, uh, if you notice, uh, mm, I will take my probability P, which I wrote here, let me take it to be, I have a certain target size N, so let me take P to be, um, to be such that, that P times the size of B equals N, or in other words, P is N over the size of B. Then on average, the size of T will be N, and moreover, this number will exactly be the expectation of X. Because each row I take with probability n over the size of b, so this is exactly the expectation. So what I'd like is the probability that x equals the expectation of x. There is something more. I'd like also that the size will be n. Let me ignore that for a second and come back to it later. And if I have this local limit theorem, then this could be roughly the probability <coughs> that a certain Gaussian uh, the, sorry, would be not the probability, but the density. The density of a certain Gaussian um, at its expectation. 
And to be more precise, because I have a lattice random walk here, I will also need to multiply by a certain determinant of lattice factor. Um, let me perhaps not explain this too much, but just to be completely clear, suppose you had even an integer walk, a walk on the integer lattice, um, but that walk could only take even steps, say. Then, uh, somehow you would have to multiply everything by 2. You will not get just the density of the Gaussian here, but the density times 2, because it should uh, take into account two places, because it still needs to sum to 1. Um, so there is some factor like that, which I don't want to say more about. Um, you can ask yourself, but wait, what about the fact that I need the size of t to be n? Well, suppose it was the case that there was one column here, which was all ones. Suppose it was the case that there was a column like that. Well, in that case, the, um, the sum of the row of, for that column of the rows which you took will be exactly the number of elements. So if you equal your average, then in particular you get n for that number. So somehow this uh, requirement is taken into account in this requirement so long as your matrix has an additional column of ones or in fact, what you need is that the span of the columns contains the vector of all ones. Very good. So what, um, what, what is um, asked here is do you need any arithmetic conditions? Can you in fact, for any target size capital N, achieve a subset of rows of size capital N for which this equation holds? And the answer is no. There are some necessary divisibility conditions, exactly as in the case of designs, really. Uh, going back here, uh, sorry, it's not, I've erased it, but it's no longer on the board, but there was if necessary conditions are satisfied. Uh, if you recall from designs, um, you need something. You can't have a design of any size. For instance, ask yourself, is there a deregular graph with exactly um, capital N edges. So there is a condition you need that the number of edges times the degree is even. Some divisibility condition. Um, and we will need this here too. But um, without going into there, this is the idea. Okay? Other questions? Okay. So what I'd like to formulate now is the theorem, the main theorem, for wi from which all of these are corollaries. However, corollaries which require some work, because as I said, this is not true for any matrix, it's true under conditions. So you have to check that in the example, the conditions are satisfied. But I will uh, not do that here. So let me write the, the main theorem. Okay, so in order to formulate these conditions, let me introduce two new notations. Uh, let me write, so I have a matrix phi, this will remain. Phi is this matrix indexed by B here and A here. It has integer entries. Let me now introduce two new notations. Um, v is the Q uh, span, span over Q, it's not so important that it's over Q of the columns of the matrix phi. So I look at what is spanned by the columns. And let me introduce also something for the row space. L is the uh, lattice generated by rows. Uh, maybe not all of you... Um, know exactly what I mean, so let me be slightly more explicit. It's everything you can get by integer combinations of the rows. Um, so it's a bit different from what I did with the columns. In the columns I took rational combinations and in the rows I take integer combination. And this lattice will be essential for what you were asking earlier for the issue of, you have to fall in the lattice somehow. We will see. Okay, and let me introduce one last definition. Call a permutation 
pi, um, pi in the permutation group of the rows, uh, a symmetry, a symmetry if um, applying pi to rows uh, leaves v invariant. So what does that mean? Um, for instance, suppose my pi switches the first two rows, then I can ask what is now the space which is spanned by the columns. And I will I say that pi is a symmetry if when doing this switch, the span of the columns does not change. And I, I already erased this uh, design example, but maybe let me put it back just so that you can see that this restriction is not as bad as it, I mean, this is not as um, esoteric as you might think. Um, here, when I have the incidence matrix for designs, I, can, I have some obvious <laughs> symmetries. If I permute the names of the variables, so somehow the, I'm taking subsets of 1 up to v, but if I permute the names, then this induces a permutation on the k subsets, but somehow the same structure is preserved. This, um, it will not change how the t subsets are contained. Indeed, that will be a symmetry. One needs to check, but that will be a symmetry. So in the examples, there is plenty of symmetries. Okay, and now I can introduce the theorem but let me do that on a different board. So uh, this theorem. Um, maybe I copy it again. So we need three conditions. Suppose one, there is a basis, there is a basis uh, for V of integer vectors with entries with, uh, let me write with L infinity norm uh, less than C. So what do I mean by that? Usually I just take the, the columns of phi are themselves, and then you see they're just 0, 1 vectors. So certainly in that case you can take C2 equals 1. So the, I'm just saying the entries of the matrix are not too big. L infinity norm is the maximum. So the entries are not too big. But now there is a similar condition for the orthogonal space. There is a basis for V perp. Uh, the orthogonal space over Q of integer vectors with L1 norm uh, at most C3. So this means that the orthogonal space is spanned by vectors which do not have too many non-zero coordinates. The sum of their non-zero coordinates is, is at most C3. Uh, this is, um, let me perhaps write, um, this might not be too clear, but this is some analog of locally decodable codes. And I think this is one of the main uh, novelties of our approach, locally decodable parity check. Uh, how is that? Well, suppose I give you the matrix and you ask me, well, is there a, is a certain vector in the column span of this matrix? There is an algorithm for me to verify that. I can check if that vector is orthogonal to the orthogonal space. So really to every vector in the basis of the orthogonal space. But since every vector in, the, in that basis is very short, I really only have to make local checks to check that the sum of a few coordinates is zero. So this is why it's locally decodable. And this relationship with coding theory is perhaps the one of the main novelties here. Um, and finally, phi has a transitive uh, symmetry group. I remind you that symmetry is a permutation of the rows and the set of symmetries forms a group and transitive means that you can go from every row to every other row via some permutation in that group. 
And the conclusion is that if uh, choosing, if uh, one chooses each row to t with probability p independently, then uh, this random vector x, which is the sum of the rows which were taken, uh, satisfies a local central limit theorem. A local central limit theorem. Which is what we need. Once that is done, you can really ask what is the probability that it equals its expectation. Um, but you still are asking, where is the arithmetic condition? Where are the necessary conditions? They are hidden here. I'd like x to equal something. Well, that something better be on the lattice generated by the rows. If uh, the target vector is not in the lattice generated by the rows, there is no way that I can hit it. But what we're saying here is that if it is in the lattice spanned by the rows, then you can hit it. And that hides all the divisibility conditions. So it satisfies the local central limit theorem, I should add, on uh, L, on this, um, on this span of the rows. So any point which is in the integer span of the rows can also be hit by this random walk. And the probability will be like the density of the Gaussian plus a small error. So if that point is very far from the expectation, the density of the Gaussian is very small, it's possible the error overwhelms the main term. But at the expectation, it's fine. A times a determinant, that's right, which uh, let me not say anything no, about. That's right, so, so that's what I write on L, and the determinant is exactly to compensate, that's right, to have everything sum up to 1. That's precisely right. There is nothing which tends to infinity. This uh, central limit theorem has an explicit error. Uh, explicit with one unidentified constant in terms of uh, C2 and uh, C3. So there is nothing which tends to infinity. It's like a Berry-Sin theorem, if you will. But I should stress that we had to um, prove, to invent and prove this theorem. There was no off-the-shelf local central limit theorem which would apply to our um, setup. So although such ideas exist, not for this particular setup. And this condition at least seems new. Because I ask for the probability that it equals a point rather than the probability that it belongs to a region. That's why it's local. Sure, that's, uh, that follows. It's easier. You, you sum. Yes. Um, and let me also say that there were works in this direction before us, notably works of McKay and co-authors. And more recently, works of Barvinok, Barvinok and Hartigan. So they applied, in a sense, similar techniques, but they don't list a general theorem of this nature. And I think this condition did not appear in their works, but they have very, very good results, sometimes better than ours. For instance, for counting regular graphs, McKay and Wormald have a famous work, which is somehow similar in some ways, but we cannot get regular graphs out of this theorem. <coughs> We can get regular hypergraphs, for instance. Um, because you need, uh, there is this C back in the designs, it's already erased. Um, you need um, lambda to be bigger than n to the 20. So for hypergraphs of uh, uniformity 20, you can do it. Yes, not, not enough graphs with uh, n to the 20 edges. That's exactly the point. And, and indeed, it, it behaves a bit different. Uh, sorry, let me just elaborate on that. If you have uh, very few rows in your matrix, uh, very few rows which you sum, then you're not yet Gaussian. You see, if you're adding random independent vectors, you will be Gaussian when you're adding many. But if you just add seven, you will not be Gaussian if you add a few. And here there is a competition between the dimension of the space and the number of steps which you take. Dimension is huge. It tends to infinity somehow <laughs> in these interesting examples. And uh, you take few steps as well. 
Uh, what we have is that the number of steps need to be, let's say, a 20th power of the dimension, say. Um, That's right. In some sense, what they show McCain and Wormald is that the probability is not equal to the density of a Gaussian. It's equal to that times a correction, so-called Edgeworth correction in their uh, work. Um, but, um, but, you know, a bit bigger than the graphs, then maybe it is applicable. Um, and, and I think uh, Alexander Bervinok knows a bit more about how few you can take. But, but certainly, it does not seem applicable to, say, Steiner systems, uh, because you're not yet Gaussian. But, but maybe those follow a different law, so you're not Gaussian, maybe you're Poisson. But this we know nothing about. Um, not in these assumptions, but the error will be too big. <coughs> um, so this, um, I, I did not write here what the what the error is, but, um, right, so <laughs> I, I preferred not to write that, but uh, somehow the minimal number of rows which you want to take needs to be polynomial in the dimension of the space in order for the local limit theorem to apply. <coughs> and that would fail. It needs to be, say, the 20th power of the dimension. And the dimension there is n, and the number of rows is the number of edges. Okay. Uh. Locally, even locally, so it's a bit slightly stronger. I'm even saying the probability that x equals a point is like the density of a Gaussian. So it's slightly stronger than that. But yes, yes. Why don't you phrase it that way? It's simple. That's what I did. I wrote x satisfies a local central limit theorem. That's exactly what I said. <laughs> um, other question? Okay, um, so I don't have much time, but I'd like to tell you uh, how this theorem is proved in what time I have. So I will not uh, say as much as uh, perhaps is possible. Okay, so a proof sketch. Idea of proof. So those a bit familiar with central limit theorems will not be surprised to learn that we use Fourier analysis. Fourier analysis is very, um, is very common in the, these type of theorems. And indeed, um, so let's, uh, let's make first a simplifying assumption. Assume uh, L is the entire lattice Z to the A for simplicity. This assumption, for instance, is not true for designs, but anyway. Uh, 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 by the way, I should have said that the fact that you satisfy a local central limit theorem, maybe I should have emphasized that, this tells you not only that the probability that you're at the expectation is positive, meaning that there is existence, meaning that x could equal its expectation, it also tells you what is that probability, which is the number of designs or the number of choices of subsets of rows. And the local central limit theorem holds with the 1 plus little of 1 error so really, you get it up to, say, 1% accuracy. OK, so back to here. Uh, I'm assuming that the lattice spanned by the rows is the entire thing, just for simplicity, z to the a. And then let me take the Fourier transform. So that's the first ingredient. Fourier transform um, x hat of theta, where theta belongs to r to the a is defined as the expectation of e to the 2 pi i, the inner product of x with theta. But because my x is the sum of rows, and these are independent, so my x is a sum of independent contributions, I can write the Fourier transform as a product, pi b and b. And there is a contribution from each row. With probability 1 minus p, I do not take the row. And which probability p, I do take the row. And then the contribution is e to the 2 pi i, the inner product of the row with theta. So this is my Fourier transform. I have an explicit expression for it. And uh, I'd like to use the inversion formula. For that, I need to introduce one additional tool, which um, 
I hope to get to later on. So we're going to... Uh, I don't know how much time I'll have. L let me perhaps first write that there is one obvious uh, inversion formula. The probability that x equals any x can be deduced from this uh, Fourier transform by an integral. It's the integral over some uh, fundamental domain, let's say minus a half, a half to the a, of uh, the Fourier transform times uh, e to the minus 2 pi i um, a x theta d theta. So this is an inversion formula. This is uh, well known. And what will this allow us to do? You see, I have an explicit formula for x hat. I'd like to know this probability. I will estimate x hat and then estimate the integral. This is the uh, idea. And, um, but to say more precisely, I just don't have the time to introduce everything, but let's try. On the Fourier space, I will introduce another norm, a covariance norm. So this is related to the covariance matrix of X. If this, is, this part is a bit fuzzy, then perhaps just ignore it. Um, but uh, So I'm uh, defining a certain norm on Fourier space, which is uh, related to the structure of my problem. Uh, it's a, given by an inner product related to the covariance matrix of X. Now, what do I have? My uh, Fourier transform is defined in this, in this uh, space out there, uh, the space of theta. Here I've drawn a minus a half a half. Uh, this is the point zero. And this norm defines for me a different fundamental domain. I don't like to integrate here. I'd like to integrate over a domain which respects the norm. Maybe this domain is like that. So I will replace this integration, and it will be equal by an integration over d, where d is a Voronoi cell of 0. And this uh, allows me to state my, um, my uh, approach a bit better in a norm. Okay, so if that step wasn't so clear, just ignore it. And now the strategy is as follows. Strategy. Let G be Gaussian with same mean and covariance as x, and covariance as x, and then we will show that x hat of theta is approximately equal to the Gaussian at the point theta uh, for theta close to zero in norm. So what is written here? You see, at the point zero, my Fourier transform is one. The Fourier transform of any random variable is one at zero. And I can do a Taylor expansion there to estimate, to approximate the Fourier transform in a neighborhood of zero. What I will find is that in that neighborhood, because it somehow it only depends on the moments of x, I see roughly the Fourier transform of a Gaussian. So when I make this integral, I will divide it into the neighborhood of zero and the rest of it. And in that neighborhood, I will just see the Gaussian. So that's all right. That means that the probability which I get, will the contribution from that neighborhood will be like the contribution to a Gaussian. And the other portion is to show that x hat theta is very small, very small, um, when far from zero in norm. And this is the more difficult part. I will then have to show that all the rest of the contribution to the Fourier transform is going to be very small. I should have drawn this neighborhood in the norm. So maybe it looks like that. So all the rest of the contribution is very small. So really all that they have is the contribution of the Gaussian. This is the strategy. And this second part is the difficult part. And this is where this uh, condition of uh, LDPC 
is used. I initially prepared this, but I see that they have no chance to explain it. So I will leave it uh, at this sketch. Um, if there are questions, I will answer, and otherwise I will write some open problems. So, yes, perhaps the sketch is a bit too fast. So, is there a chance in the case where, where the condition of not satisfied is not Gaussian, is there a chance that the second part will still be correct, but the first part so for instance, well, for in Generally, yes. I mean, generally, you'd like to say that you can still find some information in the Fourier transform. But for instance, in the work of McKay and Wormald, they find that it's not Gaussian. There is some correction. And indeed, x hat theta, in their example, is not very small outside, but somehow gradually small. It's not uniformly small like it is for us. So you, you'll have to get into a more involved analysis. But essentially, you, you do want that. You do want to say that the contribution is from a small neighborhood of zero and, and control the rest somehow. Um, may, maybe there are other limit distributions where it's really not from a neighborhood of zero. That could also be a possibility. OK, so maybe mention. Can you explain what the role of transitivity? Yes, the role of transitivity, which I did not get to, is as follows. Consider the Fourier transform. We'd like to say that it's small away from zero. How can it be small? Observe that this number is a, vec is a number of size 1 minus p pointing in the positive direction. What about this number? This number is a number of magnitude p pointing in some direction in the complex plane. Their sum is at most 1 in absolute value, but usually less. It's only going to be 1 if this points in the positive direction. So really what you would like to say is that this angle here is usually not the positive one, it's different one, and hence when you multiply a lot of stuff like that, you get to a very small magnitude. Now there is a question, um, will it be small because just one factor is a very small, or will it be small because most factors are small? The symmetry assumption allows us to relate these notions. We can show that if most of the factors are pointing in the positive direction, then all of the factors are pointing in the positive direction. And, and somehow relate that they cannot really act independently. These rows, phi of b, they, they have a dependent structure, and we can control uh, somehow, we, we can relate their effect here to the worst row or something of that nature. That's where the symmetry enters, that, the, okay, that all rows contribute similarly. Okay, so maybe I mention a few open problems in the end. One open problem is the, a conjecture of McKay and Wormald. Um, so McKay and Wormald, 90s, I think uh, 90, uh, they have a symptotic uh, formula for a uh, symptotic uh, formula for number of deregular graphs. And this is open when D is uh, between square root n and uh, n over log n. So they conjecture the formula, which should hold for any D, but they only showed it for certain ranges. And for instance, for D equals square root n, it's open. And this is of the same type, because deregular graphs are a particular case of designs, but um, we cannot get there. It's uh, too small somehow. And I should say that their conjecture is with the precision 1 plus little o of 1. So they conjectured it, say, up to 1%, uh, which still seems, uh, Peter was telling me earlier, his methods can give such uh, results, but maybe not with that precision yet, maybe later on. Okay, and there, we had a conjecture, maybe I'll not write it down, that really um, you can get the same structure as our, our theorem whenever you have a transitive group action. Um, I don't think I have uh, enough time to write it down, so maybe I leave you to read in the paper uh, a conjecture about transitive group actions. And lastly, uh, we would like to know if there is an algorithmic version of our results. So we have shown to you existence of, say, designs, can you find these designs? In many earlier cases, when there was a probabilistic existence proof, 
later an algorithm was found, for instance, for the Lovas local lemma, for Spencer's uh, six deviations suffice method. Can you find an algorithm here? We, we don't know. It, it's a bit strange because the randomness is really we're just uniformly choosing or choosing with probability p. But still, maybe you can find an algorithm. Um, and quote, for instance, I don't mind if it's probabilistic. Yeah, probabilistic algorithm, for instance. Uh, and lastly, you can ask, um, there, there's a structure called spherical designs, which is like a continuous analog of orthogonal arrays. So you can ask whether you can do it also in the continuum. And we, we think it's possible eventually, but we haven't done it. Okay, thank you very much.